Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I'm your host, Benedict Hein. If you're new to the show, welcome. So stoked to have you. If you're already a listener, welcome back. This time today, we're going to talk about something technical again, uh, but it's it's like, Malcolm just said it before the show, it's like incredibly simple and at the same time kind of complex <laughs> or like complicated or sounds complicated, but it's something that you absolutely need to know about. And uh, I think most of you have, have thought about that before or ran into this issue. Um, and it, we're talking about ADAT or SPDIF connections, which means when you need more inputs or outputs into your computer um, from your interface, but you don't want to buy a new and bigger interface, what can you do, right? Um, so ADAT and SPDIF is a way to expand your interface and get more ins and outs. And uh, we're going to explain you how that stuff works, how you know if that is an option for you, and uh, what you need to know about it, like what gear to buy. Um, and yeah, we just try to be to keep it as simple as possible, it's just so you know how to use it. You don't need to know all the ins and outs. But uh, yeah, let us help you expand your current setup to get more inputs and outputs and save some money. And I'm doing this with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood again. Hello, Malcolm. How are you? Hey, Benny. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good, too. Thank you. I already realized while I was like reading for my notes here that this is going to be more complicated than I hoped it would be. <laughs> but <laughs> we're going to get yes, through this. No, it's like it, it's something that I think a lot of people run uh, ran into or will run into eventually when they're trying to you know record more channels at the same time or give their bandmates individual uh, headphone mixes or something like that. So I think this is some this is actually overdue. We we should have talked about that a while ago. <laughs> you yeah. know, and, very useful feature. Yeah, exactly. So. We'll get to that in a second, but today I have something for our banter that I, it's really exciting. So about five minutes before I before we started this um, recording today here of the episode, I got an email from the guys at Studio Scene, which is an event that's going to happen in Germany in October and precisely on uh, from October 17th to October 19th, 2023 at uh, Messe Hamburg, Hamburg, Germany. And this is going to be a, a really cool event. There's going to be more than 30 masterclasses and audio workshops with like absolutely top tier professionals. And Malcolm and I and Wayne and Thomas and the whole team at the self Recruiting Band, we're going to be there as well. And uh, I, got the, I got an email from them that the ticketing, like the early bird uh, ticket order process has started. So you can actually go to their website now and purchase tickets. And they also officially released the list of confirmed guests now. And I'm going to tell you real quick who uh, you can expect there. So... I mean, I haven't seen this email, so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, this is, I mean, I know some of the names, I think, because you, you had yeah. a rough idea of who some might be, but I'm, yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I think um, there, there might be even more, but f so far it's, um, so the, so far the people who are going to be there and who are going to host uh, those, those workshops and that you can learn from and connect with and network with are Jason Joshua, who's worked with Beyonce, Justin Timberlake, uh, Rihanna, you know, all kinds of like Jay-Z, Alicia Keys, like it's an incredible um, credits list. So he's going to be there. He's a well -known, very well-known engineer and producer from the U.S. Then uh, Jill Zimmerman is going to be there. She's worked with Alex is on Fire, Alice Cooper. She's originally from uh, Germany. She's a Juno Award nominee, which is like, I think, the, like, the, the biggest like, Can Canadian award yeah, thing that you can one. get. Yeah, she's going to be there. She's worked with yeah Alice Cooper, Alex is on Fire, Three Days Grace. Um, amazing, amazing engineer, producer. Then Warren Huard is going to be there from Produce Like a Pro. I, I think most of you listeners will know uh, who, who he is. He's worked with uh, Aerosmith, The Fray, James Blunt, and he obviously runs Produce Like a Pro. Uh, he, his YouTube channel has over 700,000 subscribers, so he's, he's a very well-known name and just a, a really cool cool guy um he's going to be there and host workshops then um hans martin buff is going to be there another german um, producer engineer he's worked with prince the scorpions uh, peter gabriel uh so <laughs> huge. <laughs> absolutely huge absolutely huge uh so he's going to be there super awesome dude as well he's writing for uh for um uh, german recording magazines like sound and recording i think he had a column there for a while and and from what i've read there is like seems to be a cool guy as well i don't know him personally but i, I think it's going to be fun then uh and Moritz Enders is going to be there, another German one. You, uh, the Germans will know the artists he's worked with, uh, such as Silbermond, uh, The Intersphere, um, a lot of chart, um, yeah, 
you know, um, successful charts, uh, records. Then who else is going to be there? Um, Quarterhead is a German producer and songwriting duo. They've also worked with like, uh, who did they work with? Vincent Weiss, huge German artist. Mark Forster, huge German artist. So yeah, the list goes on and on. There's a couple of, of others too, but these are sort of the biggest ones on this list now. Uh, and I, I think you can already see that this is this is going to be yeah, very, very it's, cool. It's going to be wild. <laughs> Absolutely wild. Uh, yeah, St uh, Stefan Betke is going to be there. He's he, ha um, he has a, he's a mastering engineer, a very um, well known mastering engineer, and um, he's going to run. He's going to do a workshop on mastering. And so yeah, all of this is going to take place on uh, from October 17th to October 19th, and the self recording band team will be there as well it's not quite sure or like not official yet what we're going to do there but we're not going to be guests we're going to do something there as well so yeah keep you know just keep following us keep listening to the podcast and we'll let you know what exactly we're going to do but we're going to be there there will be some something will happen uh, and some of the people from on from that list that i just read will eventually appear on that podcast that's something i can also already say so this is going to be super exciting as well yeah i am um so freaking excited to go to Germany for this thing. Like, <laughs> yeah. If, uh, if somebody told me when we started this podcast that I'd get a trip to Germany to go meet like heroes of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty excited guy. <laughs> yeah. So this, yeah. is, this is cool. I'm yeah. really excited. Um, hopefully, some of the self recording, self recording band community. Uh, wants to go check out this this event and we could all hang out together. We'll definitely want to meet up with anybody that happens to be coming to Hamburg for that weekend. Absolutely. Like a, a self recording band meetup would be awesome. It's kind of central, you know, it's it's central Europe. So um, I hope that not only Germans, but like anyone somewhat close um, will will show up there. And uh, yeah, let's let, let us know. If if you're going there, let us know because if we know uh, who to expect and how many people will be, then we can plan things maybe or just like that, that would be that would be good for us to know if you just shoot us an email at podcast at the self recording band uh, and um, at the self recording band com and just let us know if you're gonna if you plan on being there and uh, yeah then we can work something out. So the options for the tickets now I have to say that though because they asked me to to say that on a podcast as well because we're like partners with them and promote that that event. Um, there's a link that's going to be in the show notes that uh, if you just go to your podcast app or if you're watching on YouTube, then just go to the, 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 the description and then you find the link where you can pre-order your tickets. There's an early bird ticket right now that I think is, uh, let me see what, what it says there. There's an early bird ticket with masterclass access that is limited to 50 tickets, so get them fast. I think this is a, like a cheaper option than buying it later, so, but it's limited to 50. Then there is, and the, the, you have the, uh, the option of uh, a th three-day ticket, a two-day ticket, or a one-day ticket, and then one three-day ticket, including the masterclasses. And if you only go for a one or two or three-day ticket, then you can purchase the masterclasses or access to those separately separately later if you want to. But like the cheapest or best deal would be the three-day early bird ticket, uh, including all masterclasses. Just go to that link, check that out, and get your ticket now. And then if you follow this show, you're going to hear more and more things about this event and what we're going to be doing there. I mean, I, real quick, I just want to say, um, because if you live in North America like I do, it might seem like there's just no, you, you might not consider going to something like that because it, I mean, it's, it's a long ways away. I get it. Um, but thing, events like this are like the best not networking opportunities I've ever I experienced in my life. Like I've gone to things like this. Um, Benny and I actually met through, you know, online communities that have events like this. Uh, we didn't get to go to the same one. We, I went to a summit, recording summit in, in Vegas, and I made like lifelong friends down there and connections that I've worked with ever since um so i don't know if you're into the recording world you should really consider this because this is going to be an amazing event that lineup's crazy uh it's good people that are putting it on um and we, we get to be involved obviously so it, it's going to be a great time really really consider it i think if you're uh, taking this serious Absolutely agree with that. And and I forgot a uh, very important thing, actually. It's not only those workshops and masterclasses. It's like a whole, um, you know, uh, exhibition sort of thing where there is uh, the, the, the world's top audio brands are going to be there and present their latest gear. So that's part of it, too. And, uh, the, yeah, it's more than 30 masterclasses and workshops. It's not only the masterclasses, but, like, smaller workshops at the booths of these audio brands. So that's a part of that, too. It's not only, like, a, an educational thing. So it's it's a whole... Like big event. Yeah, there's going to be, yeah, 
representatives from all of the, the recording brands that we yeah. use and 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 like and then there's going to be yeah these <laughs> producers and engineers not just the the ones that you just heard about there's going to be like like people like myself and Benny you know that are are going there to hear from these people right so it's like a, a whole network of peers um and then you know there's going to be a bunch of bands going as well um just for the you know the musical side of things and, and learning about recording and stuff like that as well so it's going to be a total networking hub absolutely and uh one final thing catering is also included <laughs> i just see Sweet. <laughs> so yeah uh, if you buy a ticket you get food and drinks and all of that and it's like actually really good catering so i know that that they're the partner there and uh, there's an after show party as well it's also you get access to to that too so it's a networking thing really and it's it's an all all inclusive thing so when my band toured Europe and we hit Germany, we could not believe the food that we were being given at our shows and, and <laughs> like the accommodation and like the hospitality of yeah. the German people is so incredible. I think <laughs> I, I, any <laughs> Canadian listener right now that just heard there's catering at an event is like, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible? Like, yeah, 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 the rest of the world that are really generous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, American bands tell me that all the time too. When they, they That's one reason why they love touring Europe so much. Uh, it's normal for us. But apparently not everywhere in the world. <laughs> but like, yeah. Uh, but th that's yeah. That, that's just in this case, it's a little. It's a little more than what you get at a typical show, I guess. So they 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 really they they've organized something really great there. So yeah, hope to see you all there. And uh, and if we again, if we know how many of you are are gonna gonna be there, then we can make some plans and we definitely try to 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 meet and hang out and uh, maybe do something cool together. We'll see. Let us know. All right. On to today's episode. Back to the topic of like ADET and uh, SPDIF. If you start, just started your uh, on your recording journey, you probably started with a small interface. Most people do. Like one that has only a few ins and outs, maybe just two channels or maybe an eight-channel thing. I remember I started with an eight-channel Personas interface. But uh, pretty soon I ran out of channels because I wanted to track a full drum kit and add room mics or track a band live. And like eight channels only got me so far. And if you only have a, a smaller one, then you're even more limited in, that, limited in that regard. And also another challenge that might come up is that you might want a separate like individual headphones mix for everyone in the band or for every performer and maybe the uh, the number of outputs of your interface is not enough for that now i remember back then i remember thinking that i just have to upgrade the interface and get a bigger one or back in the day actually there was i had a fire uh, um, what was it called firewire was the thing yeah interface and you could not only expand those through ADA or SPDIF, but you could daisy chain two of those interfaces. And I was wondering if i should get a second one or like there was i remember being confused about that and um after doing some research, and the same is true today, the cheapest and easiest option is, if your interface allows it, is not to buy a bigger interface or a second one, but just to get um, a device, an, a, an additional preamp or an additional box that has preamps and outputs and its own converter that is not an interface that you can connect to your interface to expand its ins and outs, like to get more inputs and outputs. And you do that through ADET or SPDIF. And usually ADAT is the thing. SPDIF is just an extra thing that most people don't really use. But uh, we're going to explain it in a, in a second too because your interface probably offers it. So now on to like what it is and how it actually works because that might sound confusing to you. You have to have spent some time looking at the back of your interface probably. <laughs> um, and, and we've actually had a couple episodes like this where we draw attention to maybe the buttons that you've just ignored on your interface if you don't know what they are, like, like the polarity switch button, like a pad button. We kind of have gone through these things. But for some reason, we've always skipped the ADAT SPDIF option. Um, and, and that is partially because some interfaces don't have it. Uh, not, it's not like a universal thing, but a lot do. So I, I'm glad that we're covering it. And, and just to put into perspective how good of an option this can be, you could find, um, I mean, budget versions of ADAT preamp uh, systems for like like 400 bucks Canadian sometimes. Um, you know, like a brand new Focusrite one is like 650, I think, or something like that. Um, maybe I'm wrong on that. But compared to a, like, so an eight channel, ADAT interface from them is, yeah, you're going to spend under a thousand bucks, where if you went and got an eight-channel interface, not ADAT 
uh, preamp, and we're going to clarify the, the, the difference there a little bit. But like from Universal Audio, you're going to spend like three to $4,000. So it's like less than 25% of the price in most of the time, um, which is incredible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and you don't have to get rid of what you're using. You're just adding on to it. So it really is cool. Um, but if you look at the back of your interface uh, and you want to find out if you have something like this, what you're going to be looking for is labels either ADAT, optical in and out, or SPDIF. I think those are kind of the three most likely things you would see on the back of your interface, um, where a Toslink ADAT cable looks like this little weird square that you would plug in. Um, where SPDIF generally looks like RCA plugs, like think of an old TV plugging in your first Nintendo 64, uh, those cables. Yes, exactly. Now, the difference between those and the old RCA cables is that both ADAT and SPDIF are digital signals. It's not an analog signal. We're going to explain why that matters in a, in a second. But yeah, you're going to see those two things usually if your interface um, offers that, that, that option that you can add more ins and outs. You're going to see one of those two or like all, all uh, like both of them uh, at the back. And let's, let's talk about what it actually is. So the definition and why it's called ADAT um, is that ADAT stands for Alesis Digital Audio Tape. And this goes back to um, early 90s where hard drives were pretty expensive, so recording on hard drives was not, not really a thing. So, but, but digital recording already was a thing. And so instead of hard drives, people recorded to tapes but stored digital data on these tapes, like videotapes, VHS tapes, basically. And those were connected through optical cables, and that was where they invented this the standard. And still to this day, it's called ADAT, but it doesn't stand... like. The name still stands for Alesis Digital Audio Tape, but today ADAT just means um, this type of connection. This is what it what, what it's been, uh, being used today for, and it's just the name state. So the cable itself and the connector itself is called Toslink. So if you see that, that's the square one. Toslink, ADAT mean the same thing. And what you can do over that cable, the optical cable and this connection, is you can send digital audio with up to eight mono channels and up to 48 kilohertz uh, um, sample rate. So it goes both ways. It's, it's, it's ins and outs. If you double the sample rate, you get half the channel. So if you go from 48 to 96, you can still send four channels over the same cable. And if you go to 192 um, kilohertz, then you get two channels. And so most people use it for like an eight channel additional connection, and they just use 44.1 or 48 kilohertz there, but you could use higher sample rates, but then you get less channels. And it's a digital signal, and that, that matters because you need to understand, that all goes back to understanding what an audio interface actually is, like the all-in-one interfaces, that it it's, it's like multiple components built into one box. And these external devices that we're talking about, the external preamps, as people often call them, they have multiple components in them too. They have the actual preamps, which are the mic inputs or the instrument inputs or the line inputs. They have, um, you know, amplifiers that, that turn those, like the, those are the preamps that turn those mic signals into line signals. And then they have a converter built into it, just like an interface that converts it to digital. And then that digital signal can be sent over the ADAT or SPDIF connection to your interface. The difference to an actual interface is that it doesn't have the actual interface part to your computer, but your interface has. And the reason why these external preamps are cheaper, despite being kind of the same thing, is that this, the actual interface part that connects your interface to your computer, if that is missing, that means they don't need to build the software for it to control it. They don't need to worry about like the drivers and latency and all that sort of stuff. And that's why those products are significantly cheaper than the actual interfaces because the interface part is missing. Other than that, they look pretty much the same and they do kind of the same thing. They amplify your signals and they convert it to digital, but they don't send it directly to your computer, but to the interface. And there they get some, like not some, uh, they, the interface, your actual interface sees those signals and then your computer sees both of those things as one big interface and the actual interface handles those additional ins and outs. That's how it works. So you only need one interface and you can then add additional channels uh, with a device that's, uh, that's a lot cheaper there. And for your computer, it just looks like one big interface. And whether or not you can, you can use that and do that and how many channels of that you can handle depends on your interface because that has already built in an interface, a card, a chip that is designed to be able to like send whatever, 20 
channels or 24 channels or something to your computer, even if it only has eight inputs or something, but the channels in the interface are already there in case you want to expand it. And that's why you see product names like the Focusrite Scarlet 1820. If you look at the Scarlet, it has eight inputs and 10 line outs. So why is it called 1820? That's because you have 10 additional digital inputs, eight, eight at two SPDIF, and you have 10 additional line out, um, the digital outputs through the same connectors. And so f the 810 suddenly becomes an 1820. And that's why it's called that. So without an expansion, it's just eight and 10. But if you add, um, for example, the Scarlet Octopri, then all of a sudden you have more inputs and uh, yeah, and the interface is built to, to be able to handle that from the beginning. Let's turn a little box into a big box, just one little piece of hardware. Um, very handy. Uh, and going back to why they're so much more affordable, like, yeah, they're, they're, like Benny said, they're also missing their, their interfacing connectivity, um, like digitally, you know, to a computer. Um, so it's missing that, but it's also missing generally any hardware or, or analog outputs as well, because it receives signals through microphones, but then it transfers it to digital to send to your master interface. It doesn't have to worry about outputting to uh, speakers or monitoring controls, like volume controls, headphones, you know, it doesn't need any of that stuff. Uh, yeah, true for the headphones, not necessarily true for the rest, because like, for example, the Octopri has, um, I have to look it up, but I think it has outputs as well, doesn't it? Um, let me just see, I might be wrong, but there are some that have ins and outs. Yeah, the Octopri has eight outputs. Eight inputs and eight outputs. So you can have, and that's why, I mean, you're right about the headphones, definitely. Um, but it has outputs. And it's different for it. not everything, not every every preamp is the same. There are preamps that are exclusively inputs. But there are boxes like the Octopre that have ins and outs. And that's why I was saying, like, if you need additional headphone mixes, you can use it. And I just said they don't have headphone outs. But you can use those line outputs to connect headphone amps. And then you get the additional outputs or like you right. know, different sets of speakers or whatever. So it totally depends on the device. Uh, but yeah, that's that could be a reason for them being cheaper. There are high-end preamps that are only preamps, but still a lot cheaper than the interfaces and they don't have outputs. And then there are like all-in-one things like the Octopreze. Yeah, the Octopreze is an incredible deal. It's like eight outs and eight ins um, and, and yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It totally depends on the device. But yeah, you, you, you're still right. They, the, the headphone amps are expensive too and they don't have any. So uh, the difference between ADAT and SPDIF is that, like, there's more to it, like, of course, the technical difference. But what you need to know is that ADAT can handle, like, eight channels. If there's two inputs and outputs, which is true for the Scarlet interface, for example, then you have 16. So, or eight at a higher sample rate. Sometimes there's just one and you can only have eight extra channels. Or like, no, I'm wrong here with the Scarlet. I think you need two, let me see. It's confusing because it's different for every box. But it usually says it at the at the back of the interface, how many you can handle. I think I remember the Scarlet has more. But the difference is basically that no matter what, the SPDIF is two channels and ADAT is eight or more. And and uh, so you need to know that. And ADAT is usually optical, whereas SPDIF is this coaxial like um, um, RCA sort of type cable, which is still carrying a digital signal, but it looks differently. And SPDIF is only used usually to add, so what would be a use case? So a typical use case for a SPDIF is an output where you might use your interface to capture the incoming signals and get them into your computer, but maybe you don't like the sound of the converter and you want a more high-end digital-to-analog conversion that goes to your speakers. So what you can do is then you can send the digital signal coming from your computer to your interface. You can send that out of the interface via SPDIF to a hardware or to an extra like high-end two-channel converter, and that thing can then convert to analog and send it to your speakers. That's what some people do where they want to optimize like their um, monitoring with a high-end uh, converter, for example. That's an example there. Or you can get two extra channels of audio into your interface if that is enough and you don't need ADAT. That's also a thing. But I think the monitoring thing is the typical application for this. Mastering people do this a lot, and um, yeah, so you yeah. can do that. So mm -hmm. I just want to circle it back again to kind of, I think, the people that need this information the most, and I think that's probably somebody that's bought a smaller interface, like mm -hmm. an Apollo Twin that I have right in front of me, where you just think, okay, I've only got two auxiliars in. If I want drums, I have to buy another interface and like upgrade. But that's just not the case. I could just grab an eight-channel ADAT preamp, 
go into my Apollo Twin, and now I've got 10 channels. I mean, which isn't, isn't oodles, but you definitely can pull off a drum kit, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, um, totally cool. And the thing is, the sad thing is, there's some smaller interfaces, like the very small ones, two channels. The Apollo has that, but like some smaller interfaces don't give you that option. So you have to look if it really, if you really can do it. I don't know if the small Scarlet, for example, has ADAC connectors. I would have to look it up. But I don't think it does. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the the small two channel Scarlet, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. And yeah. that is, you know, <laughs> kind of explains the difference between why an Apollo Twin. It costs so much more yeah. than than the the Scarlet. Yeah. Um, it's because there's all this you know future proofing technology built into it to help expand as as you need more channels. Um, so yeah. and you the software might not to have these that. options. Yeah. yeah, software and connectivity. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but you just yeah look at your interface. Google if you're unsure. Um, does it have you know additional I/O? Exactly. And I'm just looking at the back of the focus right here on the internet. And in this case, you see four of those Toslink things, the square inputs for the optical cable. Um, and the way they handle it here is that on, you have two for, two for inputs, two for outputs. And if you're, you want to do eight channels, you just use one of them. And if you want to use um, a higher sample rate, then you can also do eight channels in this case at 69 kilohertz because they added a second one and that is only used if you want to use uh, if you want to have like a higher sample rate but still eight channels so it doesn't give you 16 it just gives you eight but then you need a second ADA connection to get for channels five to eight so you know it's it's always like eight channels max but Focusrite actually gives you the option to have a higher sample rate it still get eight channels if you connect like a second second ADA cable here. Uh, that's just the way it works. Now, looking at this, I see another thing that we have to mention. Um, at the back of your interface, you might also see something that says word clock out or in, um, or just word clock or clock or something like that. That is important because, as I said, your computer is seeing this system of the two this, this two, these two boxes, your interface and the preamp or the expansion that you bought, your computer is seeing this as one interface. It only communicates with your interface and that handles the additional inputs and outputs. So the, you, t you have to tell, first of all, you have to define like what, it, what the master is. Like the, the terminology, termino terminology <laughs> is a little weird here uh, still, uh, but it, it is what it is. It's called master and slave. So one has to be the master, the other one has to be the slave. And the reason is that digital devices, they, how do I explain this? So um, the sample rate defines how often per second an analog signal is sort of, it means that 44.1, for example, means that the, the converter is looking at, and that's a simplified version, but it gets the point across. Uh, the converter is looking at the analog audio signal 44 thousand one hundred times per second and then creates a digital representation of that and although that is true for both devices if you set them to the same sample rate they are not 100 percent exactly the same one is going to be slightly faster than the other one is that there's going to be an offset it's never going to be exactly the same so the part of the interface that controls how accurate that actually is is called the clock and you have to use the same clock for both devices so that they run in sync, that they are synced up, and that there's no glitches, no clicks and pops. If you don't do that, if you don't define the master and the slave, and you don't do that, do the clocking properly, then both use their internal clocks, and there's going to be an offset, and you're going to notice clicks and pops in your audio. So you can trans uh, transfer that clock signal over ADAT, that's possible, it's just not as good or as accurate, but probably not an issue. So it's usually enough. You just have to define it on the interface or in the software, who's the master and who's the slave. But if you want to be a little more accurate, there's this extra uh, input and output there that's called word clock. And that is, that's a BNC connection is what that's called. And uh, that is more accurate. And um, if you prefer to do that, you can buy a cable for that and connect the two via that. And then the clock signal is gonna be separate from the digital audio signal. In my opinion, in most cases, not really necessary unless you have a bigger setup, gets more necessary with more things. But with just two things, you're totally fine, probably just running the clock over ADAT. We just have to mention that because that was something that, that, that frustrated me a lot back then because I didn't understand that and I, did, I had no idea why there were these clicks and pops everywhere and it was just because the clocking was wrong. I had separate sample rates on both things or I didn't define that or uh, both were running on the internal clock. And that can be really frustrating if you don't know that this is the issue. It definitely can be, yeah. So um, 
to clarify just what you do need to do, though, if you're not using a, a work clock cable, you, you'll just need to, uh, like, at first off, assign and figure out what is your master, probably your interface. <laughs> um, and then, say so you set that to 48, and you haven't set done anything onto your ADAT interface. Is that the terminology we want to use, ADAT interface? Yeah, it, it's, true. Like it's true. It's true. It's yeah. true, yeah. We got yeah. a primary interface and our ADAT interface. Uh, our ADAT interface, if it's at 44.1 and our primary is at 48, there's a problem. So we have to, they both have to be matched and we need to know which one uh, is the master for the con for the computer. And again, we know that terminology is very outdated. It just hasn't changed yet. Yeah. But, but that's just what it's called. Yeah, totally. Um, and how to set it up is then really easy. You just get the, the right cables, the square toslink cables. You connect the two devices. You Then you make sure that you have the same sample rate, that you have the master clock defined. And then it should show up in your interface's software. You just should see additional um, eight or four or whatever the amount of channels you, you added. You should see those there. And then in your DAW, you still select the same interface, but all of a sudden, this interface doesn't have just eight channels, but 16 or something. It's still exactly the same. Your DAW will still say Focusrite 1820. I just keep mentioning that interface. I don't want to make, you know, I don't want to advertise this, but like it's the one that comes to mind. Whatever interface you have, your DAW will still, still say the same thing. It just will show up with more channels now. Um, and you can assign those and just do it as usual. A thing to keep in mind uh, also is that those optical cables, they actually transfer a light signal. Like there's no, there's not an electrical signal that's going through it, not a current, like not a voltage, it's light. And um, so that, and that means that, so there's an optical sensor and light going through, and you will actually see that if you, if you push in this little, like the thing that covers the input that you see that there's light coming out of this, of this, this input thing. Um, and it's actually fascinating how that works, right? To, to me, at least. But like, it's like a, but whatever it is, a pulse, so I don't know. But for, for whatever reason, it's possible to transfer data with a light bulb. I don't know. <laughs> like an LED. Yeah, eight channels of, yeah. of audio getting sent through a cable via a light bulb. Yeah, it's, yeah. I don't really understand. Yeah. But <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. It, exactly. It is what it is. But what that means also is that the cable length is limited. Because uh, if you go longer than, they say 10 meters. Um, 10 meters is like the, the maximum they say you, you can go. Um, and after that, uh, the connection is not as stable anymore. And I've actually run into that issue myself. So I tried to connect a preamp that was in the tracking room, and I tried to connect it through an interface that was sitting in the control room. And the cable, they, for whatever reason, they still sell these cables that are longer than that, but it didn't really work well. So, uh, and then I read it up, and it's like 10 meters should be the, the maximum you should go for. Yeah. Um, and for usually, most people, that's probably yeah. more than enough. Yeah, exactly. And the, uh, as always, the shorter, the better. They are cheap as well. You don't have to go high end there. As always, like, that's this thing that you can buy. There's these like hi-fi crazy, you know, stores where you can buy an optical cable for hundreds of or thousands of dollars, which is total bullshit. But uh, because, you know, yeah, it is like, you know, that, it, for example, like if it's audio cables, I can see that there's cheaper ones and more expensive ones. There's a lot that goes into that shielding and whatnot. But in this case, you're transferring ones and zeros. There's nothing about this cable that has to be fancy. It just has to work. It either, work, it either works or it doesn't. That's all it does. And so the cheapest one, if it works, is good enough. And so, yeah, don't even worry about that. Have a better chance of working well if it's short. Yes, yeah, to down. totally, totally. Um, one thing I want to point out that I just kind of occurred to me that people maybe didn't realize is that uh, there, it doesn't matter if you're using two different brands here. So if you have uh, this, the two brands we've been using all episode, a universal audio um, interface, and then you buy a Behringer, or, or sorry, I changed brands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's go totally with it. Fine. A Behringer ADAT interface, you can use it. Or if I get a, a Focusrite ADAT interface, I can use it. Like, as long, it's all just about the connectivity. It doesn't matter if you're using different brands. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, glad you brought up a different brand there now. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I feel like... Uh, I've made up for my my focus right bashing that I did in the past on this, on this episode. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, totally right. That and that's that's important to know because then you can even save more money. Because if you look, like that's actually crazy. If you just need more ins and outs and like you don't need a higher end thing, or if it's maybe just to capture demos or whatever, um, you can get like, let me see, what this Behringer Aided thing costs. I mean, their interface, it's just kind of crazy. The 1820 interface is only like 260 euros. But their, yeah, 
and their uh, ADA, um, ADAT sort of expansion. I mean, not even that more cheap and like that that more affordable, but because it's already that cheap, it's like 219. But think about if you have an Apollo or something good or you have the Focusrite or something else, you can get an additional um, eight ins and outs for like 219 euros or like, I don't know, what was that in Canadian? 300 or something, 350 or something like that. So that is that is pretty incredible. It's like eight mic preamps. It's got line. Uh, does it have outputs as well? I don't even know. But you get you get yeah. It has eight line outputs, eight mic preamps, and the built-in converter for that amount of money. That's kind of insane. So very yeah, pretty pretty darn cool. Um, yeah, an affordable way to get up to you know drum capabilities of of multi-tracking or live bands. You know whatever you're trying to do that just needs a high channel count. This is definitely the most affordable way to get there usually. Totally. Uh, and side note, if you are one, and I know that there's a few listeners who are that, um, if you are one of those people using a digital mixing desk as your interface, um, then there might not be the option built into it, but you can get cards for that. So if you, for example, if you have the very popular Behringer X32 or the Midas M32 or something like that, I know a few of our listeners who have that, you can buy an ADAT card and just stick it to the back of the of the mixer the card is like 240 I see now, and that gives you additional inputs. And now, yeah, and now you can you can have more ins and outs, and you can record more ins and outs. And so there's a way to expand your digital desks as well with the same technology. You might just have to add a card like that. I wish I got more savvy to this earlier because it would have come in handy a few times in my life. Uh, but like you can just rent one of these as well. <laughs> you know, if you only do drums once a year, you could just rent one for next to nothing, plug it in, and you got enough I.O. for the weekend to do your demos or whatever to send it back. You know, it's like it's just really handy. Or you just have an extra big session coming up. Grab a few extra ADAT channels, build it into your existing rig, and you're off to the races. Yeah, absolutely. And also what's, what's also cool is that you can not only get more channels, you can add a different flavor as well. So your problem might not be that you need more channels, but you might want to experiment with, I don't know, a feature that your interface doesn't have. And then there are cool options like, let me just look at a few common ones. I know that Audient, for example, has one, has a preamp that, um, an eight-channel thing, that gives you an impedance control where you can uh, select different impedance for different mics or just change the color um, like the the way it sounds, uh, there is like tube preamps or hybrid sort of things where you can you can blend a, a tube or you know you can experiment and add new sonic flavors to your setup if you want to to do that. Uh, that can be pretty cool if it's not just about the channel count, but you just need two really high end channels, for example. There might be options for that. Um, and if you look at like just the list, I'm just at the German Toman website here. There is like 197 uh, preamps available, and lots of them have an ADAT. Uh, connectivity and so you can just add something to your existing interface and ecosystem and just um, create a, a, a more flexible, more fun sort of recording um, system for yourself. So I think that that's really cool too. Anything else we need to mention here? Um, I think that's pretty much it, right? No. Yeah, I think this was more of like a just a raise awareness kind of episode of like, hey, we want to make sure people know this exists because I've definitely seen people like sell their their interface and buy a, a more expensive one because they think that's the only way forward to more channels. And uh, it, sometimes you, there's just an easier way. So keep that in mind. It could be the answer you needed to, to get a higher track count. Um, it's not as scary as it sounds. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really clean setup. I love that it's just like, you know, a cable or two um, rather than a huge XLR snake uh, feeding the two interfaces. It's, yeah, it's really nice. Uh, I just want to mention one more thing here for, I know that there's the, uh, we have the, the like the beginners and the typical self-recording bands and like hobby producers, but we have also some some professionals listening to this or some just more ambitious or, you know, people uh, willing to to spend a little more or upgrade their system. And I just want to say one thing back to the SPDIF conversation. Um, I, one thing that I've personally tried and absolutely love, and it's a good example of just a, um, a use case for that, there is a box called the RME ADI2. RME is like a well-known brand that makes interfaces. And the ADI2 is just a digital-to-analog converter. It's not a classic interface. It just converts digital to analog and then 
outputs it to your speakers. Very high end, very, very, very awesome sounding converter that a lot of mastering guys use. Not crazy expensive compared to other mastering converters. It's like 1200 bucks. But uh, you connect that to your existing interface via SPDIF, for example. And then you can still have the ins that you use. You can still have the multiple outputs for headphones and stuff or a second pair of speakers, but your main speakers would then be connected to this thing. And it sounds absolutely incredible. And there are some boxes like that. And that's just in case you're wondering what you would use the SPDIF for. That's... Um, that's a typical use case. Yeah. Yeah, my Kemper has a spit-if in and out as well. So I could send like a, a, an, an amp NDI tone to the computer with just the spit-if connection if I wanted to. Um, yeah, there's just a couple use cases. And you made me think of one more clarification that I think we should address. Because uh, we keep saying this is a really affordable way to get you know cheap eight channels, preamps or whatever. And that's usually true. But you also... like. ADAT and SPDIF aren't inherently worse. Like you can get really high end preamps as well in that realm um, and get like, yeah, top of the line professional uh, preamps that you use ADAT connectivity. So it's not just a, like a c- consumer option by no. any stretch. No, absolutely not. Uh, and yeah, thank you for saying that. Absolutely not. Be- that's again because the connection doesn't matter. It's just ones and zeros. What matters is the quality of the preamps and the converters. And then it's just, you know, sent back and forth between the two devices, but that, that doesn't really matter. And, but people might be confused because we usually associate like the RCA inputs with like, you know, home sort of consumer audio equipment. But that's not the case here because we're not dealing with an analog unbalanced signal that's noisy. We're, we're dealing with um, a digital signal and it's just a, some connection. And so you're totally, you're totally right. Um, yeah, and, and you see on that RMA, uh, RME thing, for example, it has actual analog RCA um, connectors too because hi-fi people use that thing as well uh but it, yeah yeah it has that too actually but it also has it actually has, even has a remote which is also really nice but and but mastering people use it too because it sounds so great and then it has the the same looking input but it that's an as an uh, spit if uh, next to the other ones and you can also connect it via usb and use it as an interface but then you'd only have outputs you have no inputs so if you're only mixing and never recording or if you're only like producing beats on your computer and you only need uh, like a monitoring whatever then this something like that could be an option but if you're recording you couldn't use this high-end thing um you'd have to choose between that and another interface and or you can combine both if you use the spit if thing that's why it's there all right yeah um so cool um i think we we kind of covered it if that if that was confusing to you or if you you know, you might you might be you might have to go back and uh, like listen to parts of this episode again while you're setting up your system. At the end of the day, once you understand what's actually going on, it's as simple as connecting the two, dev- like getting the right device, connecting them with a cable, making sure that the same sample rate is is set on both um, devices. One is the master, and then you're ready to go. That's yeah, basically and just it. knowing that you'll be controlling it, the any digital aspect of it via your main interface software. Like that's uh, still the same hub for you. Yes, totally true. Totally true. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> See you on the next one. See you next week. Bye.